Hey there, it's your host, Johnny D. And this is your co-host, Brent Baxter. And we just got some big news to share with you. The Climb Show Music Business Podcast is now a part of the American Songwriter Podcast Network. That's right. We're really excited to be part of this network along with some other amazing podcasts. So make sure you check it out at americansongwriter.com forward slash podcast or click the link in the episode notes to listen to some of the best shows in music. That's right. I'm not just a member. I'm a fan of these shows. So, <laughs> all right, Johnny. Yeah. Welcome to the Clown. This is a show dedicated to helping singers, songwriters, and indie artists like you create leverage in the music business. Leverage is what the new artists need. You've got to prove to them that not only do you make good songs, but that people want to hear them. Not only are you a good singer, but that people want to hear it and that you've got people that are regularly listening. Listening. This is what's going to open the doors for you to the big investor, the record deal, to the management company, the publishing contract, etc. That's why we called it the climb, if you haven't figured that out yet. C L I M B, creating what? Leverage mm. in the music business. That's a Baxter name from a good friend and co-host, Mr. Brent Baxter. Brent's an award-winning hit songwriter with cuts by Alan Jackson, Randy Travis, Lady A, Joe Nichols, and more. And he helps songwriters like you turn pro by revealing how you can write like a pro, do business like a pro. And on the regular, he actually connects you to the pros. Find Brent very easily at songwritingpro.com. Once again, that's songwritingpro.com. That's right. And I would like to introduce you to my co-host, Johnny Dwinell. Johnny owns Daredevil Production. They're breaking artists digitally by identifying new fans through data. Listen, if you're an artist looking to increase your streams, blow up your video views, sell more live show tickets, and get discovered by new fans, TV and music industry pros, then Daredevil Production can help. Daredevil has worked with multi-platinum artists like Colin Ray, Tracy Lawrence, Ty Herndon, and Andy Griggs, just to name a few. You can find Johnny at DaredevilProduction.com. That is production singular. No S, and there is no S because there is no other Johnny D. How you doing, brother? Man, I'm rocking along. I'm doing all right. Uh, looking forward to diving into what topic we have on tap for today. Hopefully going to help out some songwriters and get them going. What's this about being old? Yes. Yeah, so they say it's a young man's game, right? So leaving aside the gender issues with young man's game, how can your songs compete in a young man's game when you're not exactly young? We're going to talk about that today. There we go. All right. Well, before we do that, let's take care of a little business Mm -hmm. because it's time for business. Join the Climb community if you haven't done so already. This is a thriving community of singers, songwriters, indie artists, musicians. And listen, they're all trying to do the same thing you're trying to do. They're all working together, asking questions, getting answers, and getting co-writes. There's just a great way to connect, I think. I think the more of us that know each other, the better off we're going to be. Don't you agree, Brent? Amen. Mm-hmm. Right. So listen, you have to ask to be let in. We let everybody in. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast wherever you consume your podcast so you get every single episode in a row and you can just make sure you're not missing something there. You can pick and choose what you want to listen to. Tell a friend about it. It's the best way to help us out, man. If we're getting this kind of time from you, Brent and I don't take this lightly. We got to be bringing something to the table to get your attention for as long as we do. So share that with somebody else. Let them know that it's worth it and leave a rating and review too. That'll help us out. We're trying to get to 200. And we're a little bit closer because we have another review. Oh, cool. Yes. So this is from SG Money 45 podcast that is music to my ears. Five stars. So thank you for the five star review. Nice SG yeah. money. I like that first two SG. That's <laughs> Gibson. That's Angus Young. That's awesome. <laughs> it says saddled with faces for radio. Thank you. <laughs> But armed with more essential songwriter information than any two men should have, Johnny and Brent's enthusiasm for their craft and helping others attain their goals really shines through. So much great information. I have shared this podcast over and over again with other artists and songwriters because Johnny and Brent oftentimes pull back the curtain on things everyone wants to know but don't know who to ask. Certainly worth checking out and absorbing their wisdom. Thank you for most of that, SG Money. (laughs) <laughs> yeah thanks thank you i think <laughs> yeah it ended great the start was a little rocky like my face apparently thank you how are we gonna turn on these older songwriters to write younger stuff 
Every month, I host a jam session for subscribers of songwritingpro.com. So a jam session is an acronym because you know how I like those Baxter names. And it stands for J-A-M. Just ask me. So it's a time when we get on, I'll pontificate about a little topic for a couple minutes, maybe 10 minutes, and then we spend the balance of the hour where Songwriting Pro subscribers get to hop on as part of their membership every month. And then they just fire questions away on a Zoom meeting. So we get to see each other. It's a good time of community. They get to hang out with each other and get to know each other and hear other people asking questions and I get to know them better and all that good stuff. So we jam every month. In our September jam session, one of our members asked a great question. He's getting feedback that his songs sound dated. How does he get his songs to sound younger when he isn't? <laughs> you know. So I thought it was a great question. And so if you're a Songwriting Pro member, you can check out my on-the-spot answer in the member area because all of our jam sessions are archived there. So you can check out that answer there. But it also, you know, I've given it some extra thought. And actually, it's something that's been on my mind for quite a while now. And so I want to dive in that here because honestly, not only do I apparently have a face for radio, I'm not the youngest songwriter out there anymore either. Oh, you're young to me. Well, thank you. (laughs) It's something I think about. You start writing with people that are like less than half your age. You're like, wow, look at that. So (laughs) youngins, youngins, look at that. I remember when candy bars crossed a quarter. (laughs) <laughs> what is it that McConaughey's character said in like Dazed and Confused or whatever? He's like, that's the thing about 18-year-old girls. They're always 18 or something like that. <laughs> yep. So, all right, anyway. all right, all right. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> that's the thing about 18-year-old girls. They're always 18. They're always 18, you're right. So anyway, I moved to Nashville in 2002. So I was 27 at the time. So I moved there. I wasn't the youngest one there. And, and I got my first cut at age 29. So I came into the business older than a lot of my competitors, honestly. You know, a lot of other people that move there and go to college there and that kind of stuff. I moved there after I'd been out of grad school for a couple of years. So I was a little bit older. And here in my mid 40s, I definitely have a few years, not only on many songwriters, but on a lot of artists. And so since music is constantly evolving and artists in their 20s don't want to record songs that sound like songs I loved in my 20s necessarily, although the 90s are coming back, I better stay current. So how does a middle-aged or older songwriter keep their songs fresh and young when the artists they're trying to get to record their songs are fresh and young, right? That's what I want to dive into. Love it. Sound like a plan? All right. Sounds like a plan. Sounds like a plan. All right. So first of all, uh, let me just be clear that you do not have to update your music a single lick. You just don't have to. If you don't like what's going on these days on the radio, that's fine. You don't have to write that kind of thing. Now, you may not ever get any cuts, but that's your choice. <laughs> and not chasing commercial radio success is an absolutely valid and respectable choice. So if you don't care about major market success, don't worry about what I have to say next. I just want to put that out there. It's like, no, you don't have to write what's on the radio or what's going to be up on the radio next. You just don't have to. Nobody's putting a gun to your head. You don't have to. You don't have to do that to be a valid songwriter, to be creatively alive and well. No. But if you want to get cuts in the music business, yeah, okay. (laughs) This is something you better think about. But not everyone thinks about that, and that's fine. You got to play the game that way. Yeah, if you want to be in that game, you know. If you still don't believe that forward pass is a viable option, you don't have to play football that way, but don't expect to get in the NFL. (laughs) Right. If you still don't believe that newfangled forward pass thing is real football and face mask ain't real football, well, that's great. You can play in the backyard and you can have a blast and get in great shape until you break your nose. But if you want to be in the NFL, you got to think about what the NFL is doing. So. That's right. It is football season. Praise the Lord. All right. So first of all, you don't have to update your sound. (laughs) Yes. And secondly, you may not have to radically update your music if you pivot into a more niche market or aim at more indie artists. So in other words, you don't have to update if you just write for yourself. And you may not have to update a ton if you aim at certain places. For example, some of what bluegrass artists cut is basically traditional country music. Mm -hmm. Some of your songs may not be viable on Music Row, but they may work fine in bluegrass. Or there are still Texas or other regional artists that go for more of a classic George Strait vibe. They may get on Texas radio or they may not. 
but they may be open to cutting outside songs that fit them, whether or not they fit Nashville. Mm -hmm. So I'm using country music as an example, but the same is true for various types of pop, rock. There's still people out there doing 80s hair metal rock. It's not really good on the radio, right? But if you want to find those artists, then there are still some people out there, I'm sure, doing just about anything that's ever been a thing, right? That's right. So, right. you know, there are options for cuts that maybe don't require a major overhaul of your music. And some genres just don't change a whole lot over time. I'm like bluegrass. There's still very traditional bluegrass artists out there doing their thing that can be successful. Southern gospel isn't snowballing rapidly into new areas. There are some things. So you just want to kind of check out your genre and see what's applicable. So it depends on what your goals are. There are options for cuts that don't require major overhaul. But again, that's not major commercial success, which is fine, depending on your goals. And by the way, I do write and I also pitch for bluegrass. I do that partly because I just enjoy writing country music. Mm -hmm. And so it feeds my soul. I enjoy bluegrass. I enjoy Southern. You know, I enjoy these different things. And I enjoy the folks I work with. And they have connections like in that bluegrass world. So there's an opportunity for cuts there. Same thing with Texas country. I had a top 10 in Texas a couple of years ago. It didn't change my lifestyle, but it was fun to get to sound country <laughs> and to get some of that stuff written and cut. Yeah, let me tell you something, too. Texas is its own planet. Mm -hmm. There are artists in Texas that make seven-figure livings. That don't ever have to leave Texas. That never have to leave Texas and that you've never heard of unless you're yeah, from Texas. That's right. That's what I mean by it's, it's its own country. I mean, I'm just being honest with you. It's its own planet. They don't have to leave. Yeah. I got everything they need right there. And it's much more along the lines of that old school stuff you're talking about, for sure. The red dirt. Yeah. So some of it may just be like, I don't need to update my sound a whole lot because I really love this. And I'm really great at this, but maybe I just need to go. It's an old book, Who Moved My Cheese? Yeah. If you've ever read that, where these mice in a maze and the cheese was always at the same place every day. They learned to navigate this maze like eyes closed, man. right to the cheese every day. Yeah. And then one day they go, let's move the cheese and put it in a different part of the maze. And it's an allegory, but some mice went and just sat where the cheese used to be and waited for the cheese to show up. And then right. other mice were like, well, it's not here. Let's go, Let's look go find it. it. My friend, the cheese has been moved. And it may not be coming back to where the cheese used to be. And so maybe you just go, hey, let's look at some other areas. Maybe it's a smaller niche market genres, that kind of stuff, where it's still what you do is still in fashion. And there ain't no shame in that game. I mean, I'm doing some of that because I enjoy it. And I have some of that stuff in my back catalog that it still needs to get cut. So let's pitch it over here. If y'all are cutting, I'm pitching. I just thought of this, but from a balanced perspective, if you're one of those writers that's kind of a little more old school and you find it difficult to pivot to the newer pop country kind of uh -huh. stuff that needs to happen or the bro country or whatever, you might feel a little bit better about it if you were getting some cuts with some of the stuff that you have in mm -hmm. these other markets that you're talking about. Kind of the way actors do that, like the actors who are really, really interested in acting, mm -hmm. not being a movie star necessarily, but being an actor, will do you know the big blockbuster movie where they get paid a boatload of money so that they can afford to do... Passion projects and... Passion projects, yeah. Something that they... Tribeca Film Festival. Yeah. Why can't a writer do that too? If you're really interested in being a consummate writer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's one reason I love and I'm thankful for doing The Climb, doing Songwriting Pro, and the success I've had in mainstream country that it allows me to play a little bit more and to go, let me go do some bluegrass. Let me go write some Southern gospel. Let me write with Canadian country artists while also still pursuing mainstream country because I'm playing with house money a little bit more. I can feed my creativity and let more of the dogs out to play. Yeah. Which is good for me as a writer because I'm a writer. I love writing. I get I love the people in all those different areas and getting to work with them. And yeah, getting success in those other areas is good too. Those streams of pennies add up. I don't have to go all in on this one thing, which I love too. And I do plenty of writing for commercial country. But it's fun to be able to have a little more freedom to do that and be like, that's okay. My ego is not tied to only commercial country music. I'll take a number one in Southern Gospel. Yeah. Yeah, I want to bring something else into the fold here, too, because I like the 90s country music songs. Heck I yeah. don't like where it's come now. And they can mm -hmm. 
sort of hate the new way of doing it. You know what yeah. I mean? Mm-hmm. But that's a position to take. That is right? a choice. It just occurred to me, like I remember hearing, there's a million stories out there about when Ozzy Osbourne first left Black Sabbath and went solo, he made this guitar player really famous. The guitar player's name is Randy Rhodes, right? Mm-hmm. And Randy Rhodes was the consummate guitar player. He was interested in being an amazing guitar player. Mm -hmm. And he got this platform with Ozzy Osbourne and those first two records that they did, Blizzard of Oz and, gosh, I forgot what the second one was called. But he loved classical guitar, too. So now, Mm -hmm. which sounds strange, right? Because he's doing all this stuff with Ozzy, which is metal, Mm -hmm. hair band kind of stuff. But every stop on tour, he would stop in and take a classical guitar lesson. Half the time, he would end up giving the guitar lesson as opposed to getting it. (laughs) Well, the second record was Diary of a Madman. And the reason I needed to remember that was because the song Diary of a Madman and a lot of Randy Rhodes' approach stylistically was so unique and so beautiful because he could combine the two, right? Mm -hmm. You're talking about like old school classical broke you know way back in the 16 1700s and bringing that into something that's new mm-hmm. right now so the only reason that he had that hybrid thing was because he was interested in exploring both of them yeah you know what i mean and so why can't a writer do that like how can you mix that in yeah. how can you mix something that you really love from the 90s in with something that's working today and that just might make it something a little more fresh something a little more fresh yeah yeah which leads into my next point cuz my next point is don't hate investigate yeah when i run into writers who say they want to land songs on the radio and they don't even listen to the radio cuz they don't like the radio i don't get it <laughs> I want to put my songs where I don't like them. How can you hope to hit a moving target when you don't even keep an eye on the target, right? It's ridiculous. If you don't like what's going on the radio, well, join the club. There are a lot of y'all out there. It's called darts in the dark. Yeah. I mean, there are a lot of folks out there that don't like what's going on radio, whatever format it happens to be. But that's really counterproductive. If you want to get on the radio, but you can't stand the radio, that's a problem. And so, again, don't hate, investigate. Let's say you hate Dan and Shay. Okay, fine. But a lot of people really like them, and they're having hits. So yep. go spin a Dan and Shay record and try to find something you like in those songs, in the production, in the writing, something, right? Maybe you don't like the kind of stuff Hardy writes. Well, go study up on the bazillion hits he's having these days and see what you do like about them. See if you can find out what the fans think and what the artists think about this work that's so engaging and so cool. Yeah, I'll give you something to love about with Dan and Shay is they might be some of the few and far between male country artists who can probably sing the range in your song. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like your mom said, if you can't find something good to say, don't say anything at all. Like, look for the good. I like some of what Dan and Shay's doing, but it doesn't do you any good to go, oh, they suck. I hate them. I just put it because then you don't learn nothing, right? It's more productive if you want to be a professional. That's fine if you're just a fan. You hate whatever yeah. you hate, like whatever you like. Who cares? You know, it's your business. And you can still like what you like and dislike what you dislike as a pro. But you need to go investigate and go, okay, well, this is working. Tequila was a hit. It moved the needle. People responded to it, yeah. both industry people and fans. Okay. What's great about this? And what is there that people are connecting to? Because that song did what I want my songs to do. How about this? Don't hate, investigate, and appreciate. Right. Investigate what you can appreciate. (laughs) Find something to appreciate. Yeah. I'm not a big fan of Britney Spears, but Mm -hmm. when that song, when one of those songs come on, if I'm going to think whatever, I'm in it. I'm listening to what they did. The engineering on that, the production on that is amazing. And there's a lot when it comes to making records and when it comes to the way pop works, there's a lot to be learned in there, even though it's not necessarily your cup of tea. But if you can pick up a dot to connect, Mm -hmm. why not? Exactly. It's a connecting a dot because I'm not saying you should try and copy what Dan and Shay's doing or what Hardy's doing because that's not going to work. You're not going to beat them at their own game, right? They already have that on lockdown. But if you can figure out what it is about those artists or those songs that are connecting with fans, then you can say, oh, this is the diamond, right? Let me put that in a different ring. You put your own spin on it, hopefully. And then you come out with something that's more uniquely you, but still has a hook, something to connect to the fans and go, okay, well, this is my version of that kind of thing. I'm putting some of that in what I do. You love 90s country. Well, how can I take some of what Dan and Shay does or Hardy does or Shay McAnally or Ashley Gore, whoever, you know, 
and kind of go, oh, blend that into what I'm doing so it becomes its own thing or a fresh thing or it has a foot in each world. So I'm happy and satisfied, but it also doesn't sound like it's song straight out of 1992. Yeah. So that way, people that are looking for that sort of thing, like, man, I grew up loving the 90s, you know, as an artist, but I want to get on the radio today. Oh, look, ooh, there's something that might do that. Like, it feeds me my fanboy from the 90s, but it also maybe can get on the radio. But they're not looking for something that sounds straight out of 1992. Or for some people, it's a bluegrass influence. Dirks Bentley has a lot of bluegrass influence. He did a bluegrass record. That wasn't something that was on the radio a lot, but he digs that stuff. If that's naturally what I do, how can I bring enough new elements into it that I'm satisfied bluegrassy, but it feels different than everything else that's on the radio. So maybe it has a reason, but it also feels current. You know, you start mixing this stuff in. I tell people a lot in coaching sessions, we need to find where your natural artistic passions and leanings and stuff intersect with the commercial marketplace or where it comes closest so we can hopefully bridge that gap if your goal is commercial success. Where do we find where your natural strengths and interests most closely intersect with this is what's going on or what may be going on soon? Doing that investigation thing. And to do that, you need to study current and trendy non-country artists. For example, most young country artists and writers are also listening to pop, they're listening to hip-hop, and they're listening to other types of artists. And some of that will rub off on their music at some point. You can see that Sam Hunt and Kane Brown, they didn't grow up listening only to Garth Brooks or only to George Strait. Right. There's that influence in there for sure. But you can tell they listen to a lot of other stuff too. And so is so much of the listening public. So it makes sense that you should listen to some stuff outside your normal genre. You want to listen to the melodies of pop. You want to listen to the phrasing of hip hop, even if you don't like it at first. If nothing else, it'll give you something to talk about with those whippersnappers at your local NSAI meeting, (laughs) you know, and maybe make you not seem like such a grandpa. Maybe you can at least be like the cool uncle or something. I had a coaching session, I guess it was yesterday, with a lady, and she's a grandmother, but she did more classical stuff, and then the 80s doing rock and pop stuff, and she's written children's songs. She just listened to a bunch of stuff, but she wants to get more current. And so she had homework to do. Go listen to what's current and break it down and find out how songs are being constructed these days. She wants to aim for like CCM mostly, but she does some country, but she listened to a lot of country, a lot of pop and just breaking it down going, oh my gosh, these passing notes are different. They don't go to the fifth. She's seeing how things are constructed differently. Mm -hmm. And she's like, okay, this is eye-opening. This is different from what I normally go to because she's investigating it with an open mind. And going, okay, now the next step is to start applying some of this to my writing. And that's probably going to be hard at first. But I applaud her for going, let's see what's up. And not just going, well, I'm going to make purple solo cups because that's what I think purple solo cups should be. And if you don't like it, tough. You need to start liking purple. When the market is going, we like red solo cups. Yeah, and we're looking for red solo cups. Like, do you have any red ones? Yeah, what kind of solo cups are selling? Okay, well, let's see if I can add some of that into my solo cup. So here's a thought for your next country song. Try to write a pop song with country lyrics. Just tell yourself, this is not a country song. This is not a country song. This is a pop song, melodically and structurally. And then put country lyrics to it. Now, odds are your melodies are not going to be like too pop. Odds are it's still going to sound pretty country. Like you're not going to fool pop artists and going, wow, who's that great new pop writer? It's still going to have a lot of country in there, but you might just accidentally land that song smack in the middle of a current country if you're aiming to go as pop as you can, or maybe even slightly ahead of current country, which is even better, right? Because it's better to aim where the target's going to be than where the target is now. So that's just an experiment. Just tell yourself mindset, this is going to be a pop melody and a pop structure. And just think about that. Not even I'm writing a country song, but then I'm going to stick a country lyric on it. And see what happens. Just see what happens. Same thing for like a hip hop song with country lyrics. We did that interview recently with Noah Gordon at Average Joe's. And some of their artists are definitely country hip hop fusions. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. They're fans of that kind of stuff. Colt Ford and those type of guys. But just don't be afraid to try to experiment something a little different outside your genre and try to do like your own mashup. You got to be like a mad scientist a little bit. Yeah. Tinker around with it because you might stumble onto something that all of a sudden sounds totally different, Mm -hmm. could be totally viable. And then guess what? Now you're the new hot thing and everybody wants that kind of a song. Mm -hmm. Think about Cruise. It created its own new subgenre. Yeah. The Nashvillians are doing dark 
country, which is this cross between dark side of the moon and country music. And it's all this space and maybe darker themes. And it's different, man. And yeah. that's what makes it so cool. And so if you're compelling, yeah, if you just kind of be a student of the world and wonderment of the creative process mm -hmm. and you try these shoes on, but with different laces, like here's a great visual. David Bowie used to do this one trick where he would write out the lyrics for a song and then he would cut up all the words mm -hmm. and then he would rearrange the words. Yeah. So there was like pieces of confetti with words on them essentially. Uh -huh. And then he would just mess with rearrange them. That's how we wrote Suffragette City. Slam, bam, thank you, ma'am. All that came from that. But what if you did that sort of stylistically where you tried messing with these different things mm -hmm. and you're just sort of moving stuff around and I'm, Oh, well that kind of works. That's kind of cool. Yeah. That's how you're going to discover something new and be on the front rather than be on the back end of it. Exactly. Cause again, this is about how do you make your music younger when you aren't is checking out what's new. Yeah. I was talking to my coaching client the other day about this too. It's like, that'll keep your brain younger as you age. There's that neuroplasticity. We tie our shoes the same way every day. We brush our teeth with my right hand every day mm -hmm. or every third day, whenever I get around to it. Whether you need it or not. Yeah. Whether I need it or not. We cut those neural pathways so deep, like a rut in our brains, the same way with, you know, I do these chord progressions or I do this style of thing or I do that style of thing. And it gets really hard. It's like water running through a rut. It's really hard to get the water to get out of there and go take a new path. It wants to go back into that rut. But seriously, as you get older, it's good for brain health just to... Yeah. Do things like that. And, and as writers, we're constantly solving puzzles, but they're puzzles of our own making. We're solving puzzles. We don't even know what the outside of the box looks like. You know what the puzzle is going to look like when we're done, but we're solving this puzzle. That's right. That's just another reason to do it, to try out some new stuff, is keep your brain healthier. Sidebar. Love it. So we got don't hate, investigate, look for something to appreciate. Study current and trending music that's outside your genre for the new stuff. And then co-write with young artists and writers. Co-writing might be the biggest thing you can do to stay current because you write with people half your age and they're going to have different musical influences. They're going to have different pop culture influences. They're going to have a different vocabulary and lean into that. Be humble enough to realize that they are closer to the pulse of musical culture than you probably are. So don't smash your guitar over their head just because they don't know a boy named Sue. Right. Which is sad. You should just introduce them to it because it's awesome, but don't just discount them and think they have nothing to add to the world or to the musical conversation because they don't know the classics, because they may not. And don't discount yourself from thinking that you don't have anything to add to that world. Just because you don't know the new stuff. And right. that's nothing to be embarrassed about. I mean, I think when you go in there, let's say they drop something like an idea or something like that. And if you don't know what the hell they're talking about, ask them. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. What is that? Mm -hmm. In a way, it kind of creates this cool little moment, right? Where they're like, okay, let's see where this goes. You yeah. know what I mean? You're innocently coming from the place that you don't know. Huh, you're going to yeah. add this flavor in and you're not trying to chase that because you have no idea what it is. Mm -hmm. So then they can kind of direct and pull you towards that lane a little bit, but maybe they're going to ride that wave, kind of glide on that heat coming off of you from the old school a little bit mm -hmm. and pepper it in. It's an interesting formula there. Yeah, because it may be kind of new and fresh to them because they just don't know it, right? Yeah. They don't know a boy named Sue and you just play it for them. That probably going to blow their minds. Like what? If there's something they haven't been exposed to that kind of stuff before. So you each have something that the other hopefully can appreciate because we all love music and that's why we're in the room. But that's also another reason to study the music outside your genres, keep up on the new stuff. So when you're in the room with that new person and they mention something about Cardi B or Ed Sheeran or whoever, if you have some sort of concept who that is, then you're getting a little bit more cred with them automatically. Again, you may not be quite seen as the grandpa so much as like, oh, cool uncle. Oh, you have an idea who that is. Even if you don't love it, like, oh, yeah, keep up that some. You get a little more yeah. cred starting off and may help you get back in the room with them. Be aware of it. You know, if they're young, they probably won't bring the songwriting chops that you do. And that's OK. That can be the value that you bring to the room. Maybe you figure out what needs to be said and they figure out how they would say it. Mm -hmm. Now that's super valuable. Like I know how to put a song together, the craft stuff about getting to the chorus quickly and making sure every line points to the hook and the theme of the thing. Like I got the carpentry down. I know how to build this thing, but you know what I don't know is how 19 year olds talk. Cause I'm not around 19 year olds. So mm -hmm. if you can bring that dude, this is where it gets dangerous. 
in a good way, right? You maybe don't know how to say all the stuff or how to put it all together, but you know you want what you want to say. You know what kids kids these days are dealing with and talking about and how they're talking about it and what's going on and help you remember like, oh yeah, that's what it's like to be 19. It's been a while. Yeah, I'm remembering this now. That's who you're talking to. You're helping me go back to that time in my life and you know how to say it the way they're going to say it. And I can help you put it together so it comes across effectively. That's valuable on both ends. Mm -hmm. And they may have a different natural rhythm or phrasing or cadence than you do based on their influences. And that's okay. Their influences are probably also influencing the artist you're writing for anyway. If you're in with a young writer and you're both writing for an artist, their influences may be more similar to the influences of your target artist. And so it's being humble that... Hey, I don't have all the answers. I have a set of answers, but that doesn't mean they're the best set of answers for where we're aiming for this song. So being humble enough to go, come on, give me what you got. And some of it's like, oh, that's not how I'd say it. But is that how you'd say it? Okay. I got to let go of some of how I'd say things. Be the curious explorer. Exactly. And maybe my job in the room is to hold the songwriting bar high, meaning are we on point? Are we staying on point? Is this compelling? Is this maybe clear? And I'll trust you if some of this language is clear or not, because maybe I don't get it. But if you're saying it's clear, okay, I'm going to trust you some. So hold the bar high, but let them mix a few of the cocktails on that bar. Let them throw in some of their flavors. That is really important. And then you do have value to bring. You know how to write a song. You've been doing it for years. Great. You got a lot of the craft down. Let them bring vibe and ideas that you wouldn't have and that kind of stuff. And then hopefully you come up with something that you both come out ahead and you you stop hearing that. Well, that sounds dated. (laughs) So those are my thoughts on that. You know, one other point, Mm -hmm. one of my interns this semester is way into rap and hip hop. Mm -hmm. We were just kind of talking about different styles and stuff. And I can't remember how we started this conversation, but one of the big, big, big rap albums in the last few years, don't quote me on the exact time, but was, and I can't remember the name of the artist now. I can't remember which guy it was, but the album's called Pimp and the Butterfly. Mm-hmm. And you'd know the name, but he commissioned this really badass old school jazz band mm. to come in and lay down the beats. And then they created the record around that. Mm-hmm. Who thinks about jazz and hip hop, right? Yeah. Being mashed up. That record, when it came out, won like a boatload of Grammys. Like people were freaking out because it was so interesting. And the reason it was interesting was because it was a departure Mm -hmm. from what it was doing. So embrace the departure, right? Yeah. I always forget her name. All about that bass. Megan Trainer. Megan Trainer. Thank you. Part of what was cool about that was it was this old school vibe and melodies and that kind of stuff on some of her stuff, but with current lyric and attitude. Yeah. It had some really old school kind of pop going on in there, like fifties pop, (laughs) you know, or whatever. And mixing that with current attitude, current swag, current language, subject matter. Here's the other one. The one that died with the beehive hair. Oh yeah. I'm seeing her rehab. Rehab. Yeah. 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 Sorry. Climbers hit us up in the comments. <laughs> yeah, same kind of thing, right? Mm-hmm. They sampled the drum sounds off those old records to make it sound that vintage, but they had these new pop songs and stuff. So you can do that at the writing stage, man. I think that'd be just fascinating. Yeah. So interesting. I mean, you're going to walk away from that, maybe not sure whether you liked it or not, but mm-hmm. it's like, isn't that a good thing? Get be a little uncomfortable. <laughs> oh, and that was Amy Winehouse, by the way. There you go. Thank you. Amy Winehouse. Goodness gracious. Feel free to still leave a comment, but at least we got it. Yeah. <laughs> Midland in country. It's like mm-hmm. 70s country, 70, early 80s country. Yeah. And some of that doesn't even sound thematically and stuff really that new. A lot of it feels like subject matter, still like time capsule. Yeah. But it's funny because it sounds so fresh. So there's still place for some of that stuff. Everything cycles around, but you still want to bring something a little new to it. Because when the 90s come back, they're not going to come back exactly like Alan Jackson and Clint Black and whoever. Yeah. It's going to be a little different. So you want to start adding that little different. That way, hopefully, you stay satisfied creatively, and then you also get some satisfaction monetarily, which is not a bad thing either if that's your goal. That's right. That's what we want you to have. Yep. Because, you know, we want you to win. And helping (laughs) you win, I want to let you know about a free ebook I have. It's called Think Like a Pro Songwriter. It's at songwritingpro.com. Just right there at the top toolbar, you see things as free gift. 
and that's it. You click on that. It'll take you through where to download the free ebook. It distills lessons I have learned from years in the music business. It's my gift to you. Just tell me where to send it. We email it out to you. Also, at Songwriting Pro, we have the jam sessions. I mentioned that. That's where this question came from. And we have co-writer cafes that we do monthly, which is where you can meet up online in a Zoom video conference and go into small breakout rooms and meet a bunch of other Songwriting Pro members who are looking for friends and co-writers. Almost like a speed dating. You're in this little breakout room for like 10 minutes, 12 minutes, something like that. And then we shuffle the deck and you're in the room with some other people and you just get to chat, get to know each other. We have no other pro events on the regular. So we've had film and TV people, hit songwriters. We just had Jen Shot on for one who has songs on the new Rascal Flats and Tim McGraw records. It's and killing it right now. Yeah, she's killing it. So it's your chance to go on there and ask her your questions face-to-face. So we just got a lot of stuff going on over at songwritingpro.com. So hop on over there, get the free ebook, My Gift to You, and then check out some of the events we have coming up because we got some events coming up all the time. Awesome. All right, mm-hmm. guys. So that brings us to the end of another Killer Climb episode. Make sure you join the Climb community. Subscribe to the podcast. Leave a rating and review. We're trying to get to 200 mm-hmm. and tell a friend about it. That's if you've right. been with us for this long, we got to be bringing something to the table. Spread it around, <laughs> right? right? Everybody gets a little taste, all right? This podcast exists because we want you to win. So keep on climbing. And we'll see you at the top. 